Good morning and welcome to this short act of worship for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. We begin with the collect for the day. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is taken from the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 to 8. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6 to 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me who has announced from of old the things to come. Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 86, verses 11 to the end. Psalm 86, verses 11 to the end. The response to the psalm. All nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. All nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Knit my heart to you, that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and glorify your name for evermore. For great is your steadfast love towards me, for you have delivered my soul from the depths of the grave. All nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. O God, the proud rise up against me, and a ruthless horde seek after my life. They have not set you before their eyes. But you, Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and full of kindness and truth. All nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. Turn to me and have mercy upon me, Give your strength to your servant, and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a token of your favour, that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed, because you, O Lord, have helped and comforted me. All nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord. The New Testament lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, and verses 12 to 25. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption 
when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And it's Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, and then 36 to 43. So Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, and then verses 36 to 43. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with years listen. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. So declared the late American artist Andy Warhol many decades ago. Today, there are certainly many ways in which you could get noticed, stand out from the crowd. You could go on X Factor or the Great British Bake Off and show off your artistic or culinary abilities to the nation. Alternatively, you could gain notoriety for one thing or another and get no well known for that. I suspect for most of us, though, that 15 minutes of fame remains rather elusive. But much more importantly, in the course of our daily lives, how do we stand out from the crowd as Christians? What makes us distinctive as citizens of the kingdom of God? Because if we've committed our lives to Christ and seek to follow him, then we are, above all else, members of his kingdom. Now, the Lord Jesus uses various parables to help us understand what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like. The different parables highlighting different aspects of it. So here, the parable of the wheat and the weeds addresses the question as to why it is that if God reigns over all the earth, Evil still persists. It's a question which we no doubt ask ourselves occasionally. If God is in control, then th why is there still so much evil around in the world? It's even something which many people use as an objection to faith. It's one of the most common issues people raise when exploring Christianity. Now, now, in addressing this question, Jesus draws on rural, agricultural imagery. There's the sowing of the seed and the harvesting. And in between, there's a period of apparent inactivity, though it's a period which allows for action by the enemy who comes along and sows weeds among the wheat. And because the roots of the wheat and the weeds presumably become intertwined, the master decides not to pull up the weeds until harvest time, so as not to endanger the wheat. Now, as in the case of the parable of the sower, which we considered last Sunday, the disciples asked for, ask for an explanation of this parable which Jesus gives them in clear detail. So he says that the field represents the world. In spite of appearances to the contrary, it belongs to God. He is the sower of the good seed. As the Lord declares in our reading from the prophet Isaiah, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. The universe is his. As he made it. Yet at the same time, evil is allowed to encroach upon the world, upon God's territory. And so the children of the evil one, the children of the devil, have to be weeded out of it eventually. Good and evil are, are allowed to coexist in the present, but they'll be decisively separated in the future when Christ comes again and the final judgment occurs. There is, though, a revolution which is taking place alongside this in the interim period, between the sowing and the harvesting. And that revolution is God's plan of salvation for the world. In Christ, the Son of Man, God comes to restore his rule over all things, defeating Satan through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And those who commit their lives to, to him and follow him 
are the good seed which he sows, the children of the kingdom. So Jesus makes a clear distinction here between the children of the kingdom and the children of the evil one. If we are in Christ, then we are children of God. As John 1.12 famously puts it, But to all who received him, the Lord Jesus, all who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And that good seed is sown by the sower. We become a child of God not through any virtues of our own, but through the saving work of Christ alone, through his love and mercy. The good seed have God as their father. Because of our membership of his kingdom, we're adopted into the family of God. We have that intimate relationship with the father as his sons and daughters. God's children are called righteous. The Old Testament looks forward to a time when God will establish righteousness and his people will be righteous. And the children of the kingdom will one day shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord will be reflected in and through us. Now, by contrast, the weeds, the children of the evil one, are portrayed as offspring of the devil. Unbelief and the power of evil are taken very seriously here. Those who reject the Lord fall under the influence of Satan. They do evil, literally lawlessness, rebelling against God's kingly rule over the world. And Jesus says that at the end of time, the angels will weed out not only sin itself, but everything that causes sin. The Greek word is skandala, literally the things that cause people to stumble. And their ultimate destiny is destruction. Now notice the way in which evil is treated here with the utmost seriousness. Today it's so tempting to try to water down the seriousness of sin. Because we live in a society which even questions whether there is an objective reality which we can call evil. Even though we, ex we, even though we experience the effects of evil every day in our world, in our society and in our own lives. And alongside this, there's the difficulty people often have with coming to terms with the reality of hell and judgment. Surely it's unfair, many would assert. Even those who compile the Anglican lectionary, the list of readings we use on Sundays and weekdays, have a tendency to leave out verses of scripture which touch on these matters, obviously with the intention of not wanting to upset anyone too much. But when you think about it, without judgment, there's no justice. The truth that God's love will ultimately triumph and that all the works of the devil will be destroyed is all part and parcel of the gospel message. It really is good news. In the meantime, as I say, even though evil continues to persist for the time being, the parable speaks of a silent revolution occurring now in this period between Christ's first coming and his final judgment. It's not like the kind of political revolutions we see happening in different countries from time to time, but it's a very real revolution nonetheless. And this is where we come in because we are children of that revolution if we've committed our lives to the lord and have been adopted as god's children then we're engaged in that conflict against the devil and his works as we say to those who are newly baptized fight valiantly as a disciple of christ against sin the world and the devil 
and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. The stark contrast between good and evil might seem harsh, but it is a reality. Even in our seemingly respectable society, there are endless things which stand opposed to God and his rule. And in our own lives too, we must constantly resist the works of the evil one, which war against the Holy Spirit. Because as Paul puts it down in our, in our reading from Romans, we're not those who walk according to the flesh, but rather we are those who are led by the Spirit of God. If we are truly children of God, then we simply cannot allow ourselves to be controlled by our sinful desires. But rather we are those who must seek to allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit in all things. There's no room for compromise here, no halfway house. We are called to be a people who are different. Wheat amongst the weeds, as it were, called to be righteous, both in terms of being in a right relationship with God and living a good and godly life. This is essentially what makes us distinctives, distinctive as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what gives us our X factor, as it were. Of course, it's certainly not easy. It's one thing to come together on a Sunday morning for worship. What, do, what, what does it mean for us to be children of the kingdom in the different situations in which we find ourselves, say, on Wednesday morning? But remember that in all this, the Holy Spirit is with us to help us grow in the likeness of Christ so that God may be glorified in and through our lives and that in turn through our witness others might come to know the Lord for themselves. Despite what things might look like at the present, all the evil we see in the world, the kingdom of God is at work and will ultimately triumph. So let's hold fast to that real and living hope as we seek to live for Christ in our present age. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that through your Son, you have adopted us as your children. We ask that you would guide and mould us by your Spirit, that we may be signs of your kingdom in the midst of our daily lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we conclude with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen.